Welcome to Shiloh's online services. If you are a member, welcome back. If you are a first-time visitor looking for a church home or a virtual church home, you are definitely in the right place. And now, after the next selection, you will hear from Pastor Derek A. Williams. says that we ought to praise him for his mighty acts. We ought to praise him for his excellent greatness. Or we ought to praise him for the informant of his power. Uh, and, and then David went, went off the reservation and said something like, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. If you're here this morning 
If you're on your way this morning, if you have the breath of life this morning, you ought to give God a hand clap of praise. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy of all the praise. Yes, I thank God for your presence this morning. If you have your Bibles, come and go with me uh, to the book of Genesis. Genesis uh, chapter 12. I'd like to read into your hearing verses 5 through 10. Uh, the chapter is 12, the book is Genesis, verses 5 through 10. It reads as follows. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan, they came, and Abram passed through the land upon a place of Sikkim, upon a plain of Morai. Mor 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 and the Canaanites was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And they, there built he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Haya on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, uh, going on still towards the south. Verse 10, so that you'll have the context. And there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. You may be seated in the house, in the house of the Lord. Life, life can be difficult. Uh, Sometime uh, the enemy comes comes at you like a flood. But, but this is the time that he wants to prove our faith. This is the time that we must stand uh, on the word of God. A faith that can't be tested cannot be trusted. Someone uh, once said that a faith untried may not be faith at all. Peter compared uh, the Christian trials to the testing of gold in a furnace. Job did likewise when he said, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. God's purpose in allowing trials is not only to verify our faith, but also to purify it. That, that is to remove uh, some things, to, to remove the waste from our lives the scum, the, the garbage that's getting in the way of our faithfulness unto him. God knows uh, what kind of faith we have, but we, but we don't know. And the only way that we're going to advance in the school of faith is to recognize that God is going to give us some tests along the way. Like Abraham, uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, uh, as you and I progress in the school of faith, uh, you too will face at least three kinds of tests. We will face tests of circumstances. We will face tests involving people. And we will face tests involving things. Such as it is here in the life of Abraham. Uh, I can't cover all three today. So I'm starting a series uh, uh, that, 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 that's entitled Slipping Away from God. It's the name of the series. But... But at the end of the day, I want to address the situations and the circumstance that causes us to waver in our faith. The specific thought for today simply says, don't let the situation dictate your destination. Can I get a witness? God had sent Abram down to Canaan land. He had arrived, and because of the famine, he left where God placed him and went down unto Egypt. Can I get a witness? Don't let the pressures of the, the pressures of this life dictate where you go. Can I get a witness? 
if you're not careful, uh, 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 you're going to go, you're going to go, you're going to go, you're going to go to hell. I might as well say it like that. If you let the pressures of this world uh, dictate where you are going to spend your destiny, you're going to spend it in hell. But we ought to follow the word of God. We ought to stand uh, in, uh, on his word and in his will. Don't let the circumstances dictate your choices in life. Uh, God allowed them for a reason. And if you run from them, you're simply going to face them at another time in another place. Can I get a witness? So, so here in our text, we find that Abram was faithful. He left, he left his, his country. He left his relative. He left his family, his father's house. He now resides in Canaan. And the Bible says, as soon as he arrived, a famine came. And guess what he did? He did exactly what some of us might do. He hauled off and went down to Egypt. We got to stay where God put us if you want to be blessed. Can I get a witness? I'm convinced the reason that we have weak faith and we don't get our blessing is because we don't stay where God put us. We're out of position. And God wants us to stay in position if you're going to experience the grace of God. And leaving his family and traveling to an unknown land, uh, Abram took a great step of faith. It took, a, it took strong faith to leave everything and go to a place I'll tell you about later. After he arrived, he saw God a second time and heard the promises of God. And, and guess what? Uh, he thought he was going to settle down there in Canaan and not have any, any problem. So many folk connect to the church and they think just because their names are on the road, you're not going to have any problem in this journey. Can I get a witness? But I stopped by to let you know that you're going to have some problems on this journey and you and I might as well recognize this is how God prepares us for the next step. This is the first time in record that God speaks of a famine. He had never experienced a famine before. So for the first time, uh, God, God allowed a famine to come in the most unlikely place, the place that he was supposed to be blessed, all of a sudden he's facing what? A famine. In other words, these tests, here's what I want you to know. He was celebrating the fact that he had arrived in Canaan, and you'll see in verse 6 and 7 that he was building altars, he was making sacrifices, he was calling on the name of the Lord, and all of that is great. But you need to recognize that for every victory, there is a trial. And it usually follows each other. So, so then as you, as you go through life, know that tests, tests will often follow the trials. Can I get a witness? It's all right to say amen. Listen, this is illustrated all through the Bible. Uh, just as soon as the, uh, the, the children of Israel was led out of Egypt, delivered out of Egypt, they found themselves with their back against the wall at the Red Sea. Can I get a witness? Uh, that's, that was testing after victory. Can I get a witness? And, and just, just while they were on the uh, shores of the sea, uh, uh, Red Sea, uh, God delivered them and allowed them to cross over on dry land. As soon as they crossed over on dry land, guess what happened, y'all? Three days later, they had no water. I'm trying to tell you that there's always trials after victory. As uh, soon as they got a little water in themselves, 30 days later they were now hungry and didn't have anything to eat. Every time there's a victory, you ought to look for a trial. That's how the enemy works in our lives. God teaches that, that we should personally seek him and we ought to look to God when in fact we are in those situations. God expects us to call upon his name. However, if, you're, if you have weak faith, if we ignore God, if we turn away from God, if we begin to slip away from God, getting our, we will get ourselves in all kinds of trouble. And I believe, I believe in the life of Abraham on his journey, we'll see today that weak faith always lead us downhill into more trouble. Can I get a witness? Weak faith will always lead us into more and more trouble. Let's look at the context. The context of this text, we find the back, which is the background, the situation, is that, is, that, is that 
Abram had arrived out of obedience to where God told him to go. And, and some of us think we got it made just because you put your name on the roll. Some of us think that as soon as, soon as you accept Christ, you got it made. But actually the battle is really just beginning. The enemy doesn't care if you're going to sit on the sideline and do nothing. He ain't going to waste energy on you. But as soon as you make a move and act like you're going to serve the Lord and act like that you're going to do that ministry, I want you to know that you're going to have some opposition along the way. Can I get a witness up in here? So my first point of the hour is simply this. Uh, unexpected situations in God's will causes us to doubt. In other words, Abram had arrived in Canaan. He left everything and he, out of obedience to God, he went to uh, Canaan land. And, and, and it was the least expected place where he thought he was going to have uh, the issues of life. Check out verse 5. The Bible says that they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. The location of the famine occurred, uh, was a great challenge to Abraham, Abram, and it, it occurred at a time uh, when in fact he thought he was in the will of God. So what I'm trying to tell you that in the circumstances of life, in the situations of life, there's always a place that will rattle our existence, will shake our faith, in that it occurred in the least likely place that he was ready to have handle it. Can I get a witness? Uh, so, so then, so then, so then, out of obedience, out of obedience, oftentimes, uh, our victory is often followed by a trial. When we win the victory, you can, you may feel like you've been, you're overconfident. Some of us get overconfident, right? Uh, some of us begin to get the big head and, and think that we can do anything at any time. We start depending on our past experiences as opposed to and the knowledge of, God, of the world as opposed to the knowledge of God. That's why God allows these tests to come into our lives. He don't want to, he want to keep us rooted and grounded in the word of God. And if he doesn't give us trials, we think we did something ourselves. And he doesn't want us to feel that we did it ourselves. Therefore, therefore, God did not want Abraham to become proud and self-confident. So God put him his faith in the furnace. Anybody ever been tried by fire in the furnace? Anybody ever been tried by uh, trials of life? The first trial he had was he thought he was operating in the will of God. Uh, to face trouble in the will of God causes him, caused him to wonder if he was really in the will of God. That's how the enemy messes with your mind. Uh, you finally decided that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna have daily devotion in my life. I'm gonna start praying every day, reading my Bible every day, coming to church uh, every large day morning. And as soon as you make up your mind to do that, uh, you think you're safe, but the enemy penetrates you to the point that makes you question whether or not it's really worth it. Can I get a witness? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? So, so, he, uh, so, so when things happen and we think we're in the will of God, it shakes our faith. It causes us to doubt. We have a tendency to depend and judge everything based on our success. But, but, and, 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 and so trouble come in and the will of God, we immediately question whether or not we're in the will of God. But can I tell somebody this morning that success it's not determined by our circumstances, but because we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. I want you to know that success is determined by the word of God. It's not the famine who defines it. It's not a, it's not a pandemic that defines it. I want you to know it comes from God and God alone. In other words, uh, uh, the word of God doesn't change because of your trial. Because of the famine, because of the pandemic, the word of God is the word of God. Can I get a witness? We need to, we need to know the word of God well enough that we can stay in 
the will of God. The problem is the least little wind blows. We think we learned two or three verses. Wind blows and all of a sudden we, are, we move from where he placed us. But we got to stand on the word of God. We need to stand uh, boldly in his will. Can I get a witness? Do you know that God said that my word shall not return void? My word shall accomplish that that I sent it to accomplish. And it says it will prosper in the life of those who receive it. We have to stand on the word of God. Who told you that this journey was going to be easy? Who told you that there wouldn't be any problems along the way? Last time I checked the record, the Bible says many are the affliction of the righteous, but God delivers us from them all. We have to stay on the Lord's side and let God fight our battle. Can I get a witness? His faith was also shaken uh, because of the promises. God had told Abram that I'm going to give you this land, and all of a sudden there's a famine in the land. What's up with that? I hope you're following me here. God, but see, 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 the problem is this. All of a sudden, what he thought was a, what he was expecting a blessing looked like a curse because of the famine. But what he didn't know was the Bible says the Canaanites was in the land. And in order to get the Canaanites out of the land so that they can claim the land, God allowed some things to happen in the land. Everything is not about you. This pandemic may not be about you, but it's about evil folk that he's trying to get their attention of. Can I get somebody, can I get a witness this morning? He had to, he had, in order to vacate the land so that they can inherit the land, he had to chase the enemies out of the land. God is doing a work right now in this pandemic. He's shaking some norms up. He's doing some things differently than you've ever seen before. And somebody ought to be a little bit more blessed because of it if you're on the right side. Can I get a witness? It's not always about you. It's about God doing a bigger work for you. Can I get a witness? So, so nowhere in scripture it says this life or this journey is going to be easy. Actually, it teaches just the opposite. In other words, you could expect some trials along the way. That's why James says, uh, count it all joy. When you fall into what? Diverse temptation. Knowing that the testing of your faith does what? Produces patience. What God is trying to do in our lives is to produce some patience so that we can do some things that we can't do right now. You got to be patient. So let patient have its perfect work so that you can be complete, that you can be, you can be, you can be complete and wanting nothing. What a blessing that he's trying to do in our lives. We don't always understand the work of the Lord, but it's never about you. It's always about a bigger picture. So hold on to your faith. Have strong faith and don't run from where God has placed you. Can I get a witness? In other words, don't let the situation dictate your destination. But not only did uh, Abram have to face uh, the site, the location in which uh, he was staying, but the second point is this. The time after great victory in God is critical. Are critical, critical times. And that's because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And as soon as he sees that we've had a victory, he wants to undermine the work that God is doing in our lives and with our lives. Can I get a witness? He attacks at that particular time so that he can change your mind and my mind. Can I get a witness? Check out, check out. Uh, so here, here, here we find that not only did the famine come at a specific site, but it also came in a particular season. In verse 7 and 8, you'll discover that Abram was building offers, altars, altars. He was also sacrificing uh, offerings to God. And the Bible said he was calling upon the name of the Lord. And it's nothing wrong with any of that, except that when you are praising the Lord, when you are experiencing a great victory in your life, don't ever let your guards down to think that the enemy is not trying to take you out. Can I get a witness? He dropped his defenses while he was celebrating and praising the Lord. 
That's a dangerous point in life for any and all of us. Can I get a witness? While he was celebrating is when the enemy, when the famine showed up in life. Isn't that just like life? You finally, you finally got that promotion. You finally put enough pennies together to buy that new car. You finally bought that home. You finally found Mr. Wright or Miss Wright. And all of a sudden, another trial comes into your life. One that you did not expect it. I'm trying to tell you, the enemy is trying to keep you off balance. He wants to undermine what God is doing in your life. You can't haul off and go down to Egypt. You got to stay in that relationship. You got to stay where God has put you and let the Lord guide you along the way. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. So after you have won the victory of faith, you can expect the enemy is going to attack you or the Lord is going to test you. Can I get a witness? That, that, that strategy there, y'all, that strategy. This is how we grow in faith. God uses tough circumstances in life to build the muscles of your faith, to keep you uh, uh, from trusting anything other than the word. So then you can't run away. You got to stay where God put you and, and work through what God has given you to do. Uh, you got to stay what? Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain. Can I, can I say it another way? You got to keep on working regardless of how it looks. Then. You got to keep laboring in the Lord. If he's told you to go and do it, you got to do it regardless to the pandemic. You got to do it regardless of the circumstances around you. For as far as you know, your labor is not in vain. That says God is going to come through. Don't relax after your victory is what I'm trying to say. Your victory itself is never the focus. The critical time when we have to be on God with the enemy is the moment after the victory. Can I get a witness? Anybody ever been blessed? Anybody ever experienced the victory of God? Anybody ever let their gods down the moment after they finally dipped whatever it was? That's when the enemy attacks. And that's when the enemy attacked Abram. He had finally made it to Canaan. He was praising the Lord and he dropped his God. God told me to tell you, it's a critical time after each victory in your life. And you need to be on God so that you will not be swept away. Now, there's nothing wrong with celebrating a victory. In fact, you need to give God the honor, the glory, and the praise. You need to celebrate to, to re-energize yourself, not yourself, but for the next battle, you need to have some celebration so that God can fuel you to go to the next level. But I believe, I believe that you have to be on God. You have to be on God when you have these victories. Finally got that promotion. Finally got the best job that I ever looked for in my life. Finally, finally had a child. Whatever the blessing is, beware that it's not the blessing, but it's the moment after the blessing that the enemy is going to sneak into your camp. For us collectively at the church, finally got the ministry off the ground. Finally uh, got folk to start coming back to church. And I'm telling you, right after the victory, there will be something else on the other side of it. And that's why, as a church, we have to pray that God will strengthen us for the journey and that he will allow us to never drop our gods so the enemy can sneak in. Y'all might remember uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was tasked with leading the children of Israel to build the wall around Jerusalem. Can I get a witness? Uh, long story short, in chapter 2, we find that the enemy got upset because Nehemiah showed up to help the, the Israelites. Can I get a witness? In chapter 4, we find that as they was making progress on building the wall, the enemy decided secretly uh, to, 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 to build an army to come up against Israel. And when Nehemiah heard about the army, he began to tell uh, the Israelites, you all need to be on watch so that you'll be able to fight if you have to. Can I get a witness? In fact, he told them to have a brick in one hand 
and a weapon in the other hand because you never know when the enemy is going to attack. I'm trying to tell somebody today that we have to stay, we have to be on God. We have to stay on the wall watching the enemy and the discernment of God to know when the enemy is going to attack us. Don't celebrate to the point where you let your God down. But not only, not only the celebration, but I believe, I believe what you have to do is to make sure you are protected. You make to make sure that you have the whole armor of God. The enemy is trying to take you out. He come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I hear Jesus saying, but I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Can I get a witness? Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that, that you be able to stand in those last and evil days. Stand your ground. Stand so that after doing everything you know to do, you got to still what? Stand. Stand with the helmet of salvation. Stand with the breastplate of righteousness. Stand with the sword of the spirit. Stand with the belt of truth. Stand with the shield of faith. Stand with the shoes of, of, of peace so that you won't be taken by surprise. We're sitting ducks if in fact we let our God down. We're sitting ducks if we don't uh, put on the whole armor of God so that God, so that God will protect us. Can I get a witness? Do you know it's God who's protecting you? I thank God for the scientists who have learned that the best way, the best tools we have to eradicate this virus is to wear masks and social distancing. That's good advice. But at the end of the day, it's not that mask, it's not that distance, it's the Lord that's protecting you and protecting me. Do the right thing, but know that it's God who's protecting us. Did I, did, did I tell you that the, that the enemy wants to sideline you? The enemy wants to take Abram out of his game. The enemy wants to take you. He wants to sideline us out of fear. He wants to sideline us out of distraction. He wants to sideline us out of temptation. He wants to sideline us because of frustration. But the devil is a liar. All you have to do is to stand on the word of God and be sure that you're in his will. And the God that I serve says that he shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. The point is simply this. Beware of the dangers of post-victory and post-blessings. Don't let victory or blessings puff you up with pride or cause you to let your God down so the enemy can change your course. Don't let the situation dictate your destination. Can I get a witness? Last but not least, I want you to know here in the life of Abram, not only do we uh, should be on guard about the sight and the season of our trial, but sometimes it's the severity of the trial. Can I get a witness? Uh, trials are opportunities to develop our faith and to glorify God. That's why James, y'all thought James was off the reservation, didn't you? But James, when James said, count it all joy, he counted it all joy because for every trial that you have is an opportunity. Can I get a witness? Opportunity to strengthen your faith and it's an opportunity to glorify God. Can I get a witness? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Can I tell you right here, the more severe the trial, the greater the opportunity. You want to count it all joy. Check out the text. It's right here in the text. The Bible says that the famine was grievous. Not only did Ab Abram have to deal with the timing and the sight, he had to deal with the severity. In every situation, there's a place, there's a time, and there's a severity that you and I have to take under consideration. And if the sight don't run you off, the timing might run you off. If the timing don't run you off, the severity might run you off. The enemy has a strategy. And we have to be careful to know that he's doing his work. Can I get a witness? The Bible says that the famine was grievous. That, that means it was dangerous. It was critical. It was, it was serious. It was severe. Anybody ever had any severe situations that occur in our lives? You might as well say amen. If, if you haven't, you keep on laying down and getting up. 
you will have a severe trial in your life, a severe situation in your life that you're going to have to look to the Lord. Don't do like Abram. When it got severe, Abram picked him up and he went down into Egypt. And God told him to go to Canaan land. Can I get a witness? So we have to be careful and knowledgeable of, of, of the leading of the Lord wherever you are in life. Particularly be careful because Abram went down into Egypt. Anytime you see Egypt in the Bible, it's a symbol of the world. He went down into the world. He went down into the bondage of the world. That's what it really means. And when we talk about Canaan land, it's a picture of God bless people where they're going to be inherited. Can I get a witness? I found it interesting that when people talk about Jerusalem, it's always they went up. But when they talk about Egypt, they say they went down. Can I get a witness? There's a reason for that. And, and going down into Egypt means that you're going down doubting who God really is. You're going down uh, questioning his promises. You're going down running to the world and away from God. You don't want to go down. I don't know about you, but I want to go up. Anybody want to go up? Anybody want to go up? If you want to go up, you got to trust in the word of God. You got to stand on the word of God and in the will of God to go up. Now, if you don't want to go up, you can do anything else. You can do nothing and go to hell. But if you want to go to heaven, you got to have a desire to stand on the word of God. It takes strong faith to abide in the will of God. In other words, strong faith will come to us so that we will have opportunities. Opportunities for what? Opportunities, first of all, to strengthen our faith. That's why you ought to count it all joy. Because a trial is an opportunity to strengthen your faith. Faith cannot be developed and made stronger on peaches and ice cream diet. You do not build muscles in the physical body by breast, by, by uh, 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 lifting mushrooms or feathers. Can I get a witness? You ain't gonna build no muscles in this body by lifting a feather, can I get a witness? If you wanna build some muscles in this body, you gotta lift some things that's a little bit heavier that, than, than that, can I get a witness? Things that are strenuous if you're gonna build the muscles. And the same thing it is with trials. Stop crying about your trials. The greater the trial, the greater the opportunity to build muscles of faith. God wants us to have strong faith. Now, now you might be processing that, that you might say, well, Pastor, the Bible says we don't have to have a whole lot of faith. You're right. You don't have to have a whole lot of faith, but the faith that you do have ought to be strong. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Some people get lost in that. The Bible says, uh, Jesus told his disciples that if you have faith the size of a grain of, of a mustard seed, you could speak to a sycamore tree, uproot itself, and be planted in the middle of the sea. In another place, the Bible says that he told his disciples that if you had the, the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, that you can move mountains. Anybody want to move mountains in your life? God's telling me to tell you this morning that you don't have to have a lot of faith, but you have to have strong faith if you want God to move the mountains in your life. Stop complaining to God about your mountain and start telling your mountain about your God. Can I get a witness? If you're sick, start, you got to start speaking it. Speak those things that are not as though they were. Start speaking in faith and watch and see won't God move in your life. Can I get a witness up in here? If you're sick, start speaking, now I'm healed. If you're broke, Start speaking now, I am blessed. Can I get a witness? If you're lonely, God will give you comfort and a companion. Am I right about it? We got to start speaking. We got to start speaking to our mountains uh, so, that, so that our faith will be active in our lives. The enemy makes us close our mouth as if we don't have a whole lot to say. 
but you always got something to say. Don't let the enemy chase you, but instead, you got to allow the trial to develop patience in you. When circumstances are difficult, and when you feel like you're in the fiery furnace, hang on in there. Don't haul off and leave where God placed you. You got to stay where you are and let him develop patience in your life. Can I get a witness? But not only, not only that, I want you to know that the, great, the will of God will never carry you where his grace can't keep you. I know I say that a lot, but that's a part of my life. I've discovered, and I'm still discovering, that the will of God will never carry me where his grace can't keep me. I've had some of the largest assignments when I was working in corporate America. It seemed like they always gave me the most difficult programs. Those that was long out of control under the poor management of someone else. And they would throw me into this bad situation. And I don't know what they expected, but I'm here to tell you, I faced it knowing that I couldn't do it by myself. And I'm standing before you this morning to let you know that every opportunity that they gave me, I depended on the Lord and that program began to flourish and all of a sudden I was among the top programs for, for senior management. Can I get a witness? I'm trying to tell you, put your trust in the Lord regardless of how it looks and watch him work it out on your behalf. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? But not only that, not only, not only uh, will it strengthen your faith, but secondly, trials come so that God can be glorified. Do you know he wants to brag on you? He wants, he wants, he wants to say to the enemy, you know, Deacon Bean may have started off slow, but Deacon Bean is doing some stuff right now. Can I get a witness? He wants to brag on you. He wants to brag on me so that he can get the glory. Every trial not only is an opportunity to strengthen your faith, but every trial is an opportunity for God to be glorified. Can I get a witness? So then, so then, we ought to, we ought to stop complaining. Mary and Martha complained about their brother Lazarus, who had died. You remember that? The Bible said he had died, and Mary and Martha was thinking that he didn't come quick enough. And when he finally showed up, it was four days later. And Jesus showed up, and Mary, Mary and Martha said to, to Jesus, you know, had you been here a few days earlier, maybe you could make a difference. Why you want to know where he's buried now? Jesus said, show me. Show me where you buried him. And he said, didn't I tell you this kind? Something, some situation, some circumstances in life, it's not about you, it's about glory to God. And this was one of those situations that, that he allowed Lathers to die and was buried for four days Martha said, he's, the body's already stinking now. Why do you want to know where he's laying? Show me where you laid him. The Bible said they rolled the stone away. He called Lazarus by name. And I want you to know that he got up from a grave, a four-day grave, and walked out in mommy clothes. You ought to give God a hand clap of praise. It was not for Lazarus. It was not for Mary or Martha. It was so that God can show his power. That's what he does in our lives. Our trials come to strengthen our faith. Our trials come that we might glorify God. Can I tell you that we ought to, have I told you that we ought to stop complaining to God about our trials? Because our trials is there for our purposes. If you want to complain about anything, you ought to complain about the fact that you've not done near as much as Jesus. Can I tell you that if anybody could have complained, it would have been Jesus. He died on Calvary for you and for me. Can I get a witness? They, they scourged him, his spirit. They, they put crowns of thrones on his head. Uh, uh, they speared him in the side. They hung him on the old rugged cross. And he decided to stay there so that the Father might be glorified. In other words, we got to go through some stuff if, in fact, we want to glorify the Father. In the case of Jesus, he was obedient even unto death so that what? The Father might be glorified. Can I get a witness? So then, so then, uh, stop complaining. Stop complaining about your suffering. And stop, stop asking questions, uh, 
how can I get out of this? Most people I know begin to think when, they're, when, when they fall into divers temptation, how can I get out of this? You ought to start thinking, what can I get out of this? And the what can I get out of this is much more important than how did I find myself in this situation. For God knows what's best for you. He knows uh, uh, that he's working it out for your good. He's working it out for his purpose and his glory. So you and I ought to be good students, good instruments to glorify God. So at the end of the day, remember, remember this. God alone is in control of the circumstances of our lives. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'd rather, I'd rather be at risk with Jesus than to be comfortable without Jesus. Abram chose to go down to Egypt to be comfortable without the grace of the Lord. I would prefer to stay in Canaan land with the Lord than to be in Egypt without the Lord. That's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. Because I discovered a whole, a long time ago that we need the Lord on our side and we need him in the circumstances of life. If we're going to not be uh, persuaded by the situation, then we need inspiration from the Lord. We need to get the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives, I'm here to tell you that he will he will provide for you. He will take care of you. Can I, can I tell somebody that, that Jesus went to the cross? He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was chastised for our peace. Can I get a witness? And by his stripes, we are healed. He got up early Sunday morning with all power in his hand. Power that you and I might not fear the situations of life, but power that we can be obedient to the call of the Lord. So on this Lord's Day morning, don't let the situation dictate your destination. I want to look up, I want to, I want, I want, I want to look up my eyes into the hills. I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to be with Jesus. And as long as you're looking up and going up, you're making progress. But if you ever decide to major in going down, going down to Egypt, going down with the world, you're headed to an unintended place. Give God a hand clap of praise. Don't let your situation dictate your destination. There may be someone here at this hour who may not know Jesus in the pardoning of their sin. Or there may be someone under the sound of my voice in remote locations around the country. I want you to know that you should never let the pressures of the world dictate your destination. You have a choice to make. And I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like Joshua. He said, ask for me in my house. You have to make that decision. The door of the church is open. You don't have to go through, through this by yourself. You don't have to go through this all alone. He said, I, I'll never forsake you. All you got to do is to accept him as your personal savior and allow him to guide and to guard your life. Lead if you're here this morning and don't know him in the pardoning of your sin, why don't you come right now? Or maybe you accepted him some time ago. But you got sidetracked. Lord, this is a great time to return to the Lord. If you leave, Why don't you come? Me, me along the Lord. way. Lord, if you leave me, I cannot stray. Stay with thee. 
the church say amen. Amen, amen again. Amen. To God be the glory. This is uh, the appointed time where we come together and observe the Lord's Supper out of obedience to the Lord's command. We'd like for you to know that uh, the communion packets, which includes the cup and a wafer, is in the back of the pew. So at the appropriate time as you're led, we would ask you to hold, have that in hand and follow along as we observe the Lord's Supper. And for you at home, I hope and pray that by now you have your own supplies of bread and of the cup so that you too can be obedient uh, to the Lord's command. The Bible says that it was on a Thursday night that he took the bread as he sat with his disciples and they supped. The Bible said that he took the bread and he broke it and reminded them that this bread is a symbol of my, my broken body that was broken on Calvary for you and, and for me. After they had supped, he then took the cup and reminded them that this cup represents the New Testament of my blood, blood that was spilled on Calvary for you and for me. As often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you do show forth my death until I come again. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you now for, for knowing that you care, you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, for uh, being called your children. For you called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And it's because of your light, Lord, that we have a light that might shine before men. We pray that you will strengthen us for the journey. Along the way, Father, we pray that you will never allow the situations of life to dictate our destination. That is, Lord, uh, let, uh, let us be more fearful of, of you and the leading of the Holy Spirit than we are the pressures of the world. Now, Lord, as we assemble this morning, we pray that you will bless uh, the bread and the wine. Though they are carnal in nature, we understand, Father, that they are symbols of when and how you sacrifice your life that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We pray, Lord, that you will search the hearts of these, your people. Uh, we pray that you'll give them a clean heart and a right spirit, Father, that they might be worthy to be called your children. Strengthen us now for the journey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If you would now follow along as we administer the Lord's Supper. Again, it was a Thursday night. He instructed his disciples that this bread is a symbol of my broken body. Eat ye all of it. After they had supped, he then took the cup. Reminded them that this cup is a symbol of my spilled blood. Blood that was spilled on Calvary for you and for me. Blood that allows our sins to be washed away. Drink ye all of it. As often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you do show forth my death until I come again. Let's remember the promise in Luke 6, 38. Here at Shiloh, there are four ways to give. You can give by check, cash, PayPal, or Givelify. Give and it shall be given unto you. Don't neglect your tithes and offerings. Thank you for joining our online virtual service. 
We pray that you were blessed and encouraged in some way by the word today. Please come back again next week and join the celebration here at Shiloh Baptist Church of Orlando.